Hey, I'm golf broadcaster Matt Adams, the updated and expanded second edition of my book, The Golf Round I'll Never Forget, Golf's Biggest Stars Recall Their Finest Moments, is now available. Readers can expect to march with Arnie's Army at the 1960 U.S. Open, relive Jack Nicklaus's remarkable 1986 Masters win, and be amazed by the Tiger Slam. The Golf Round I'll Never Forget, Golf's Biggest Stars Recall Their Finest Moments. Pick it up where fine books are sold, including barnesandnoble.com and amazon.com. This Day in Sports History. And welcome back to This Dish, a member of the Sports History Podcast Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sports. Learn more and find additional podcasts at sportshistorynetwork.com. It's June 25th, and on this day, it was a great day to be a San Antonio Spurs fan. So this day, in different years, was good for the Spurs. First, Let's go to 1997. It was the NBA draft, and the San Antonio Spurs had the top pick. With that pick, the Spurs took Tim Duncan out of Wake Forest. Duncan had been a four-year star for the Deacons and a two-time ACC Player of the Year. He averaged a double-double as a sophomore, junior, and a senior. He was, without a doubt, the best player in the draft, and the Spurs were in the perfect spot to pick him up. He was also a great fit with San Antonio and head coach Greg Popovich. The big fundamental, as Duncan was known to be called from time to time, had a laid-back personality but a tenacious style on the court. He was humble, yet he became one of the best power forwards in the game. He ended up playing 19 years in the NBA, helping the Spurs win five NBA championships. He also won the league MVP in 2002 and again in 2003. He made an immediate impact with the Spurs, too, averaging 21 points and 12 rebounds a game, and he earned Rookie of the Year honors. He averaged a double-double as a pro for the first 13 years of his 19-year career. Now, exactly two years after the Spurs selected Duncan with the top pick, the Spurs were in the NBA Finals against the New York Knicks. So, 1999, this is Game 5 of the NBA Finals with San Antonio in a position to close out the series. The Spurs were the top seed out of the West with the twin towers of Duncan and the Admiral David Robinson. The Knicks were the first eight seed to run the playoff gauntlet and make the finals, but the Knicks' good fortune had run out, and this was not the most offensive series known to man. No team scored 100 points in the five games, and Game 5 came down more to shots missed than shots made. Playing at home, the Knicks only shot 44% in this one and relied on Latrell Sprewell, who seemed to be the only one who could score for New York in this one. Spree scored 25 of his 35 in the second half, and after his pair of free throws with 3-12 remaining, gave the Knicks a three-point lead. They would never score again. The Spurs weren't much better shooting the ball on the night, hitting just 40% of their shots, but Duncan, now in his second year with the Spurs, provided the offense they needed. He scored 31 in this one. He led San Antonio in four of the five games in scoring in the series, but the man who gave the Spurs the bucket they needed in the crucial moment was not Duncan or David Robinson or Sean Elliott or Mario Elie, the guys who had been in that moment before. Instead, it was 5'11", inch Avery Johnson, a man who went undrafted, had been cut five times by NBA rosters, including twice by the Spurs, that hit the bucket they needed. With the MSG crowd shouting defense, the Knicks doubled Robinson who found Sean Elliott. Elliott passed up the shot and found a wide open Avery Johnson in the corner who buried a 17-footer with 47 seconds left to give San Antonio the lead for good. He only scored eight points on the night, but those two were the biggest of his career. The Spurs won the game 78-77 and won the series, becoming the first ABA team to win an NBA title since the merger in 1976. Since we mentioned how the NBA draft in 97 helped the Spurs win the title in 99, well, on this night in 1979, 
The Los Angeles Lakers drafted Irvin Magic Johnson with the first pick in the NBA draft. Magic's impact was also immediate, helping the Lakers win the NBA championship in 1980, becoming just the third player to win an NCAA title and NBA title in consecutive years. He would be part of five NBA titles in LA, and so with the success that Magic had in year one, did that equate to Rookie of the Year honors? It did not. Larry Bird was the top rookie in the 79-80 season, but if you look at the 79 draft list, you will not find Bird's name anywhere. Instead, Bird was selected by the Boston Celtics in the 78 draft, but decided to go back to Indiana State for his senior season. The Celtics kept his rights up until draft night. In the beginning, GM Red Auerbach was not willing to pay Bird more than any other Celtic. But after long negotiations with Bird and his agent, they finally came to terms on a deal that made Larry Legend the highest paid rookie at that point in time. If they had not, though, Bird's name would have been put back in the mix for the 79 draft, and he most certainly would not have wound up with the Celtics. On this night in 1948, it was Joe Lewis's last professional fight, and his legacy was nearly tarnished. Lewis was in the ring with Jersey Joe Walcott in Yankee Stadium. He had announced that no matter what happened on this night, this would be his last fight. He won the heavyweight title in 1937 and defended his belt 24 times. But Jersey Joe was not willing to let the Brown Bomber ride off into the sunset on happy trails without a good fight. Well, at least make it a challenge. This wasn't the most exciting boxing match in the history of the world. Jersey Joe danced and jabbed, danced and jabbed some more. The crowd booed the fighters for the lack of any action. The referee warned both fighters about stalling and encouraged them to pick up the pace or risk a deduction. Walcott did manage to put the champ on the mat in the third round, but Lewis bounced right back up. After 10 rounds, the judges had Walcott ahead, and Joe Lewis's untarnished record since becoming a champ was in serious jeopardy. But Lewis came out in the 11th with renewed vigor and connected a right hook to Walcott's jaw. That one stung, and Lewis moved in for the kill, delivering a combination of punches to the body and the face. After Lewis landed another right to the jaw, Walcott hit the mat and could not make it back to his feet before the 10 count. Joe Lewis retired as the heavyweight champ, holding the heavyweight crown for 11 years, defending it successfully 25 times. On this night, four years later, in 1952, it was another fight in Yankee Stadium. And like the Lewis Walcott fight, this one is not remembered as being one of the all time greats, but rather for the strange conditions and occurrences and a bit of an unusual finish. This was a light heavyweight bout between Sugar Ray Robinson and Joey Maxim, but there really was another opponent in the ring that night for both fighters the heat. One reporter wrote that the green paint on the press box benches was melting that night. Officially, the temperature was 104 degrees in NYC, but adding in the bright Klieg lights around the ring, it was decidedly hotter inside of it. Robinson was the instigator and aggressor in the early rounds, delivering jabs and hooks, body blows, and shots to the face. Through the first nine rounds, Robinson dominated on all three judges' scorecards. Between the 10th and 11th rounds, the referee Ruby Goldstein collapsed due to heat exhaustion and was unable to continue. It was the first time in boxing history that the referee had been knocked out. Goldstein said it was like the Sahara Desert in the ring and that in the previous round, the fighters were blurs and he could not track the punches. He was replaced by another referee. Now, Robinson's early action in the fight may have given him the lead on the cards, but it also took a toll on him physically. In the 13th round, he started to let his hands drop. His legs started to wobble. Maxim took advantage of the openings, but could not or would not put him down. He had no need to worry, though. The heat would deliver the knockout blow. When the bell ended the 13th, Robinson had to be dragged back to his corner, where he collapsed onto his stool. When the bell rang starting the 14th, Robinson couldn't stand. Even though he had a substantial lead, he could not answer the bell, and Maxim was the champ.
and in 1992, Philadelphia Eagles all-pro defensive lineman Jerome Brown was killed in a car accident. Brown was driving his new Corvette with his 12-year-old nephew as a passenger in his hometown of Brooksville, Florida, when his car began to fishtail on wet pavement. It skidded out of control, hit a palm tree, and then rolled. He and his nephew were killed instantly. Brown was 27. Brown had played six years in the NFL and had been a pro bowler in both the 1990 and 91 seasons. He had been one of the big reasons for the Eagles having the best defense in the league, teaming up with Reggie White, Clyde Simmons, and Mike Pitts to form one of the best defensive fronts in the 90s. And time now for today's non-sports did you know. English muffins were invented in the United States. It wasn't until the 1980s when Brits started enjoying all those nooks and crannies. That's all for today. I'll have more tomorrow on This Dish. This Day in Sports History is a member of the Sports History Podcast Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sports. Learn more and find additional podcasts at sportshistorynetwork.com. This has been an original Thrive Suite production. Hey there, sports history fan. This is Arnie Chapman, a.k.a. the Football History Dude. And I hope that you enjoyed this recent episode presented by the Sports History Network and were able to learn some good old-fashioned sports history knowledge nuggets. I started the Sports History Network back in 2020 with the mission to help podcasters find a community of like-minded sports history nerds as well as helping aspiring podcasters to start their own shows. We have a little bit over 30 shows on the network right now covering all sorts of sports history, but as far as I'm concerned, we're just at the toothpick in the ocean moment, you know, that can't even figure it out because there's so much more coming. We wanted to create the ultimate headquarters for sports yesteryear, starting with Podcast Network and our website, but we're going to continue to move into other mediums as well. And here's the cool part, because we want you to be part of our team. So if you're interested in starting your own podcast, or maybe being a guest on one of our shows, Or who knows, maybe even writing an article for us over on the website. Seriously, all you got to do is reach out to us on the contact page over at sportshistorynetwork.com. You can be as technologically savvy as a Neanderthal tapping on a stone trying to figure out this whole hieroglyphics thing back in the day. Again, it doesn't matter because even if you don't understand the whole podcast space, we have a production team that can pretty much help you out with doing everything. All you got to do, head over to sportshistorynetwork.com, head to the contact page, fill it out. That message goes right to me and I'll reach out to you as soon as I can. But for now, dude, I'm through if you're through.